Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been working in the field of tectonic modeling. And uh, surface dynamics is not a total stranger in tectonic modeling field. But still, I'm pretty much new to serious um, surface dynamics research. So I hope my title doesn't give you a false impression that um, I'm going to give uh, a grand vision of um, unifying those two fields. Instead, um, I'll be a lot less ambitious, and um, I'll take this opportunity to introduce to you a tool that I developed for tectonic modeling, which can potentially be useful for surface dynamics research. So here's, my, the, here's the outline of my talk. First, I'll give you an overview of the code snack. And then I'll give you some examples of a tectonic um, models with um, surface processes um, included. Assuming that you are all familiar with erosion in um, orogenic environment, I chose a couple of examples from um, extensional environments. And at the end, I'll give you a um, uh, quick preview of ongoing um, project that is trying to couple one uh, surface modeling code with the tectonic modeling code. And I'll discuss um, how SNAC can fit into that project. More often than not, um, I have to worry about losing audience uh, because of too much math. But this CSGMS meeting must be one of the exceptions. And um, so I put up the equation slide first without being apologetic. I don't know, maybe I should apologize that um, there's too little math or the, too low level math. Anyways, um, so SNAC is an acronym for Saint Germain Analysis of Continua. Saint Germain is the name of software framework on which SNAG is built. So name itself doesn't have much meaning, but um, at least it sounds friendly. Um, the governing equation of, of SNAG is the um, momentum balance equation given in the form of the principle of virtual power. It is the use of this integrated form that renders the snag comparable to finite element method. In snag, the spatial domain is discretized into hexahedral elements, and each hexahedron is subdivided into two different sets of five tetrahedra. So the basic unit of computation, or the element type, is the linear tetrahedron. But the mesh is organized in this hierarchical and redundant way to ensure a symmetric response. The final form of discretized momentum equation is nothing more than the sec Newton's second of motion. So the time rate of change of momentum at a given global node L is the sum of surface force and body force, which are also the sum of all the contributing uh, tetrahedron around that global node L. So once you get the net force acting on a node, on a node then um, acceleration is time integrated to get velocity and update grid point. Um, the one advantage of explicit formulation is that there is no need for nonlinear iteration. And because um, the time integration is explicit, all the updated quantities, velocity and um, grid point location, is, depend, is depending only on the previous time steps quantities. And velocity and um, node locations are updated through leapfrog method. And it's obvious that description of motion is Lagrangian, in which grid points move with material. It's nice to have um, dyna dynamic um, formulation because uh, in the nonlinear problems, we don't have to worry about convergence issue. However, to get a static or quasi-static solution, we need to damp out the inertia. That means, well, we need to include a certain dissipative process. And SNAC uses so-called local damping, such that <clears throat> before we update the velocity, the actual net force on the node is damped by a certain uh, damping force. And the damping force is determined as a fixed proportion of the net force itself 
but it's acting on the negative, the opposite direction to the current velocity. So if you look at this um, a very simple 1D damped oscillator, it might sound ridiculous to go through this um, dynamic relaxation scheme to get a solution, because you simply divide this um, gravitational mg um, with spring constant k. But in multi-degrees of freedom problem, the spring constant k becomes a very large sparse matrix, stiff matrix, and inverting it is not trivial at all. So this dynamic relaxation scheme is particularly useful for nonlinear problems. Another issue with dynamic formulation is that the time integration is not always stable, and the time step size is governed by so-called Courant condition. So if we have a kilometer resolution, and if we consider the typical P wave velocity in the crust, then time scale is easily uh, becomes less than a second, and that is prohibitive to cover uh, millions or tens of million years of model time. One way to go around that limitation is to adjust P wave velocity. So the, <clears throat> if we convert the usual definition of P wave velocity from stiffness matrix, sorry, stiffness uh, divided by density, but if we uh, volume integrate them, we can have a corresponding stiffness divided by a certain mass. And we adjust this value of mass, we call it uh, scaled mass, then we can have a lot smaller P wave velocity than physical value, then we can have a uh, sufficiently large time step. So um, the actual gravitational mass is not touched, so the problem itself doesn't change, only the dynamic relaxation step is affected. The constituted model employed in SNAG is elasto-viscoplastic. Conceptually, it's a linear combination of elastic, viscous, and plastic units. This model is very flexible. For instance, if we have a very high viscosity, then the material, whole material becomes essentially um, plastic material, for example, uh, more coulomb. And if yield stress is set to be extremely high, then whole material becomes essentially Maxwell physical elastic. So if we have a um, temperature dependent viscosity, then brittle ductile transition will be naturally determined by a given temperature field. And if we have um, yield stress that is a function of a certain internal variable, then we can have strain hardening or softening, which is um, required for a strain localization phenomena. SNAG is an MPI parallel code. So here I'm showing some uh, data from performance tests. So on the right, the plot shows work clock time for three different problem size as a function of uh, number of pores. And on the right, it's a corresponding speed up data. For the smallest problem size, it, uh, the performance degrades uh, pretty quickly. So if you look at the speed up, it actually decreases when number of cores goes uh, beyond 1,000. It is because the uh, overhead of MPI operations quickly dominate the overall numerical cost uh, when the, uh, the local domain size is too small. But if we increase the problem size, then performance stays pretty good. It's very close to uh, ideal value um, up to core number of 4,096. In terms of efficiency, it stays above 70%. Now we've covered the main features of SNAG. I'll give you a demo uh, simulation <coughs> to actually see how it works. So the uh, example I brought is, is um, oblique rifting problem. This is um, a model setting from a sandbox analog model. So a um, box filled with sna uh, sand is considered as a, a block of crust, brittle crust, and it's pulled on two sides. And inside the domain, we have a rift zone, which has some obliquity to the extensional direction. And inside the rift zone, it can be strained, but outside of it, all the uh, uh, box remains as um, 
moves as a, a rigid blocks. And on the right, you can see the surface deformation pattern after some um, extension. To set up a comparable model with SNAG, but in a real uh, continental rifting scale, I set up a domain with the size of 100 by 100 kilometers and 20 kilometers thick. So this is a brittle cluster block, and I'm pulling this block on two sides. As in sandbox model, I define a rifting zone, which can be strained, but outside of it, there's no uh, gradient of velocity. And at the same time, I put some uh, weak seed only within the rifting zone so that faults can develop out of those seeds. So this image show the pattern of uh, accumulated plastic strain after some extension. So this is the animation that shows how actually the fault system develops. So you can see initial plastic seeds and as extension goes on, you can see that faults grow out of one of those seeds and they try to connect to each other. So the bottom box shows accumulated plastic strain distribution and the top warped surface is the exaggerated topography. So the maximum relief from the highest to lowest point is about one kilometers. So let me just run the animation again. So individual faults are making pretty much a perpendicular uh, direction to the extension. However, the interconnected structures are follow the predefined uh, rifting zone. In that sense, it's uh, pretty much consistent with the sandbox model. So in summary, SNAG is a 3D parallel Lagrangian code for elasto viscoplastic material. It has been benchmarked and it's decently documented it's an open source being distributed through um, the website of computational infrastructure for geodynamics. And it's been linked to CSDMS website too. Now let's move on to a more important issue of um, how tectonic and surface processes interact with each other. So erosion in a convergent origin is now an iconic problem demonstrating um, those two processes interact in a non-trivial way. So um, this picture is from a paper by Willett, um, GGR99, and it shows that pro or retro uh, wedge um, uh, erosion can lead to completely different patterns of uh, exhumation. So again, uh, assuming that all of you are familiar with this type of um, interaction, I chose a couple of projects uh, in the opposite um, uh, setting. Opposite in a sense that we'll be uh, looking at um, extensional tectonics rather than compressional one. And then sedimentation rather than erosion will be the process that adds complexity. So the first example is the rifting style with and without sedimentation. It has been suggested that hot and thick continental crust um, when it's um, extended, then it will go through a wide rifting. Wide rifting meaning um, distribution of extension is pretty much uh, uniform over a wide region. However, if the extended region is covered by sediments, then the style of rifting changes to narrow or focused rifting. Bialas and Buck showed this uh, using a numerical model. So they set up um, thick and, uh, a thick continental crust, which is about 50 kilometers thick and about three times wider. And if you look at the temperature field, um, it is hotter than the surroundings uh, because it has um, a, a more abundant um, radiogenic um, heat. And as you expected, the numerical model shows that um, without sedimentation, the rifting system evolves uh, with a wide rifting style. 
So after about uh, five million years extension, which corresponds to 100 kilometers of extension, you can see from this phase field and temperature field that the extended region has pretty much uniform thickness. And at the same time, if you look at the strain weight field, the two ends, two uh, boundaries of the extending region is always the side of maximum deformation. However, you get completely different response when you start to adding uh, sediments. So on top of the extending region, this green stuff represents some um, sediment layer. So after about, again, uh, 100 kilometers of extension, um, if you look at the strain rate field, now there's only one side of active deformation. And if you look at the temperature field, um, it has clearly um, asymmetric uh, thickness variation. In other words, um, the whole system is now going through uh, focused rifting. And the reason is that the thick blanket of sediments increase the uh, boundary layer thickness, and the system will try to take advantage of um, non-uniform strength. In other words, the weakest part uh, will, uh, only the weakest part survive and takes up all the extension. And another example I'm going to show is about uh, rider blocks. Rider blocks is the pieces uh, cut off from a hanging wall of a large offset normal fault. So it's a little uh, tricky concept uh, just described by words. So I'm going to show an animation. This animation captures the process of um, rider block formation. So this is a um, 10 kilometer thick crust and 100 kilometer wide and is being um, pulled on two sides and being supported by uh, invested fluid on the bottom. So let me run it again. No more fault develops and it rotates quickly and as it rotates it locks and then new fault forms and at the same time rider blocks form. Just one more time. So these blocks are called rider blocks. They are passively riding the um, foot wall and uh, being transported. So here's a generic uh, mechanism for rider block formation. So first you have a new fault that follows a so-called optimal angle. But as offset on the fault increases, the crustal layers um, um, isostatically bend and therefore fault rotates and eventually it locks up. And if it cannot take any more offset, then the uh, crust will develop a new fault at a higher angle than currently locked fault. Then a piece of uh, crust that is um, between these two faults uh, becomes a rider block. According to this conceptual model, we can uh, infer uh, two conditions for rider block formation. Um, first, we can say that a fault is too weak, then the fault is never going to lock up even if it becomes a low angle. And at the same time, if fault is strong enough, if there is nothing on the hanging wall side, in other words, if there is no sedimentary infill in this rifted valley, then rider blocks wouldn't form. So if we turn these arguments around, then the presence of rider blocks implies that fault is strong enough and there should be enough uh, amount of sedimentary infill. And these um, two conditions for rider block formation has very interesting um, uh, implication. So um, I'm now showing you um, um, oceanic core complex like its uh, continental counterpart um, in an oceanic core complex, mid crustal material is exposed on the surface through a large offset normal fault. So this uh, specific core complex is at about uh, 30 degrees north along mid-Atlantic ridge. And this is um, Atlantis transform, and it's right north of it. So it's called uh, Atlantis massive. 
So if you look at the uh, more detailed bathymetry map, this um, whole block is called Atlantis Massif. And if we take um, a cross section of topography and also structural interpretation from south to north, then it looks like um, this. So at the southern tip, it has a very smooth and corrugated surface. But to the north, it has more rugged uh, topography. Um, the interpretation of this um, difference, uh, along which uh, difference in topography by Reston and Ranero is that as you go north, you get closer to segment, uh, rich segment center, where magmatism is more active. That means the whole rift valley is filled with uh, volcanic infill, but at the tip of rich segment, magmatism is not as active, so it doesn't have uh, that much of volcanic infill. That means even if fault can be strong enough to have rider blocks, at the southern tip where there's no sedimentary infill, you cannot have rider blocks. But if you get closer to segment center, then there is enough of uh, sedimentary infill and fault is strong enough so that you can have multiple rider blocks. So we've just seen that um, sedimentation or space filling surface process is also important in tectonic uh, processes. So in 2D settings, sediments are usually assumed that it's transported along the third dimension in and out of plane and as much as we need. So a lot of hand waving is going on there. And as we've seen in the oceanic core complex problem, some problems are inherently three-dimensional. So that leads us to conclude that um, physically based 3D coupling between tectonic and surface process modeling is desired. There is one uh, ongoing uh, effort uh, led by uh, Fedra Upton in JNS Science New Zealand and Greg Tucker here at uh, University of Colorado. They are trying to couple a tectonic modeling code FLAC 3D that is a commercial um, geotechnical uh, modeling code and child, the surface processing code. So um, as a, a pilot um, model, they uh, set up a 60 by 60 kilometers and 10 kilometers thick domain, which is pushed from the left at a rate of one centimeter per year. And the whole left half of the domain is actually kinematical, kin kinematically constrained. And the right half has a uh, free slip boundary condition. So according to these kinematic boundary conditions, mountain, build, mountain belt will be built in the middle of the domain. And that uh, topography developed in the code of flag 3D is given to child, and child will process by, um, will adjust that topography by erosion, and that uh, adjusted topography is given back to flag 3D, and it going, keep going that way. So here is a preliminary result from this uh, coupling project. On the left, the material is assumed highly erodible. And on the right, material is less erodible. some problem. Maybe it's not critical. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure why that one's so okay. Sorry. So um, <clears throat> the result uh, you are supposed to be see is that highly erodible material has <laughs> um, slightly um, larger wavelength of topography along the mountain belt, and less erodible material has um, a higher frequency uh, topography, 
And at the same time, the maximum topography for less erodible material is obviously a lot higher. Um, so this simplistic and preliminary model already shows that um, this the power of um, code coupling. Then the question is, um, can SNAP be used in place of Flag 3D in this type of project? So Flag 3D is 3D, SNAP is 3D too. SNAP can handle inelastic deformation, which is necessary for uh, uh, build a mountain belt. And SNAP can handle non-uniform boundary conditions too. The remaining question is, um, can SNAP be coupled with child? The answer is actually yes, but the real question should be asked is, uh, how? And SNAG is based on um, software framework, so I believe it's already uh, in a pretty good shape to be uh, incorporated into CMT system. So um, I'd like to um, come up with a little more concrete plan for this uh, coupling uh, during this uh, meeting. And use of uh, open source like SNAG should be beneficial, not only financially, but uh, also scientifically, because uh, researchers can uh, modify the code for their own purposes. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Well, I have a question. The, the seeding that you did for the first example yes. of SNAG, how much does that uh, determine the outcome of the rift uh, geometry, number of rifts, spacing, and so on? It's uh, very hard to quantify, so um, I actually trying to um, calculate a collective property like the um, uh, displacement versus, well, the length versus um, the fault drop uh, ratio or the size distribution. So um, it can be defined only that in a collective way. Mm -hmm. So um, if I change the distribution of initial seeds, it will definitely change uh, the pattern. But um, it's not clear whether that collective property will be also changing. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Great. Uh, uh, wonderful talk. Um, can you comment on? Right. Is it can, on? Can you tell us a little about um, whether SNAC can go to very high strains? Do you use regridding or something like that? Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> well, to add something, um, there is an issue with regrading. As you know, um, regrading involves um, um, numerical diffusion, which can be sometimes very serious. So um, it would be great if we can come up with a, a, a better um, algorithm than the currently implemented in SNAP. This is, again, a simple question, but that when you actually put the sediment, the example that you showed where you um, filled yes. your basin with sediment. Where did that sediment come from? Do you have like rudimentary surface processes that you actually removed material um, from the block and deposited it, or you just mm. basically created mass? Um, short answer is uh, we simply create material as much as we want. But um, that model actually inc included um, very simple, like the diffusion style uh, topographic um, modification. But okay. um, that amount is not uh, totally constrained, uh, not totally constraining the amount of um, actual sediment we put in in the basin. Okay. Others? Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice talk.